What's up, Space Monkeys? Welcome to Political Fight Club. I'm Robert Durden. I'm going to be reading Dreamland again today, chapter 15. It's called The Pain on page 80. We might do two, but I kind of doubt it. I think I'm just going to get one out of the way and we'll do another one tomorrow at some point. So it's a great book so far, and I found a couple new possibilities for future book clubs at the bookstore today. So I'll get those out to you as options at the end of this book here. So we're going to start on page 80, The Pain. Through most of the 20th century, doctors treating the terminally ill faced attitudes that seemed medieval when it came to opiates. Docs who prescribed the painkillers were treated as virtual outlaws. Parsimon parsimony described how drugs were distributed. Several doctors' signatures were often required even for small doses as dying people writhed in the most indecent pain. Treatments for pain came in strange concoctions. One was called the Brompton Cocktail, a combo named for the English hospital where it was used. Morphine, cocaine, Thorazine, honey, gin, and water, which read to me like a concoction some street junkie would come up with, but which I'm told was pretty effective. You don't say. I wonder why. In the 1970s, attitudes slowly began changing. In England, Cicely Saunders, a nurse and researcher, opened a hospice that treated terminally cancer patients with opiates. Under under Saunders, St. Christopher's Hospice in London was the world's first to combine care for the dying with research and clinical trials. St. Christopher's was inspired by the idea that patients should be treated for pain without the drugs that also destroyed their personalities. Saunders' employee, Robert Twycross, began experiments that showed enormous benefits from using opiates on dying cancer patients. St. Christopher's promoted opiates, sometimes at high doses, to relieve the pain of the dying. Saunders and Twycross believed it inhumane to do otherwise. If people were soon to die, what did it matter if they were addicted? Wasn't pain relief and a dignified death more important? At St. Christopher's, dying patients were given opiates regularly, whether they were in pain or not. The Queen honored Saunders with damehood. Dame Sicily and Twycross worked hard to change minds, though this took longer in the U.S., where decades of opiate demonization made doctors wary. Twycross once said that exiting a plane in New York City that he, quote, he quote, could smell the fear of addiction in America. In 1972, a British company called Knapp Phar Pharmaceuticals developed a controlled release formula known as Continus that the company first put to use as an asthma medicine. One day, Twycross suggested to some Knapp reps that their company might use Continus to develop a time-release morphine pill. Knapp eventually did so, and this proved important to this story. It offered doctors a new tool for treating pain in dying patients. Knapp, also, is owned by Purdue, the laxative manufacturer that Arthur Sackler and his brothers had purchased in the 1950s. Meanwhile, a Swedish cancer pa or a physician named Jan Sternsward was put in a position to change pain treatment worldwide. Sternsward was made chief of the cancer program of the WHO in Geneva in 1980. He'd spent time years before in a Kenyan hospital, where he witnessed acres of cancer patients dying in agony. The Third World lacked the resources to treat cancer. With morphine, Sternsward felt patients could at least spend their last days pain-free, but doctors refused to use it, fearing addiction. Now, as WHO's new cancer chief, Sternsward remembered Kenya. He set about establishing norms for treating dying cancer patients with opiates, primarily morphine. 10 milligram morphine pills cost a penny a piece. This would allow Sternsward believed the same care the world over to people who were leaving life as to those who were entering it. He met Vittorio Ventafrida, who ran a foundation in Milan that was the first in Italy to provide paid treatment for terminally ill patients. Lunching with Sternsward one day in the cafeteria of WHO's Geneva headquarters, Ventafrida wrote out on a napkin simple principles for treating dying patients with opiates. It was a ladder of treatment. Increasingly powerful drugs, including opiates combined with non-opiates, should be used if pain did not subside. This was a radical idea at the time. Sternsward later gathered most of the world's few experts in pain treatment, 16 in all, in a medieval castle in Milan to shape a world health policy, and brought that napkin with him. The ladder that Ventafrida outlined at lunch that day enshrined the idea that opiates should be used to deal with the terminally ill on whom non-opiates did not work. This was a humane approach. 
particularly in countries where few had access to cancer treatment. WHO published a book in more than 20 languages laying out simple pain treatment steps, which came to be known as the WHO ladder. Within it, morphine was deemed, quote, an essential drug in cancer pain relief. WHO went further. It claimed freedom from pain as a universal human right. The latter was accompanied by a concept relevant to our story that moved public and medical opinion. It was this. If a patient said he was in pain, doctors should believe him and prescribe accordingly. This attitude grew from a patient, patient's rights movement that sprung up in part due to the Nuremberg trials, where Nazi doctors were found to be experimenters who disregarded patients' autonomy, and later from the 1960s counterculture that suspected that the motives of all established institutions, medical or medicine included. With the WHO ladder, doctors' concern over the use of opium-derived drugs began to ease. They were, after all, remarkably effective at knocking down pain, which was now a human right. Worldwide morphine consumption began to climb, rising 30-fold between 1980 and 2011. But a strange thing happened. Use didn't rise in the developing world, which might reasonably be, reasonably be viewed as the reason, region in most acute pain. Instead, the wealthiest countries with 20% of the world's population came to consume almost all, more than 90% of the world's morphine. This was due to prejudice against opiates and regulations on their use in the poor countries, on which the WHO ladder apparently had little effect. This opiophobia ruled these countries, and still does, as patients are allowed to die in grotesque agony rather than be provided the relief that opium-based painkillers provide. Indeed, a major opium producer has minute per capita consumption of morphine, India, 0.12 milligrams per capita a year in 2011, due mostly to government bureaucracy that taxes the drug heavily. In 1985, members of the International Association for the Study of Pain met in Buenos Aires. While there, the pain specialist visited a hospital where a neurosurgeon told them that opiates were allowed only for those undergoing surgery. He was forced every year to perform a thousand chordotomies for those with chronic pain, severing the pain and temperature nerves in a patient's spine. Quote, it was appalling. That was more than all the chordotomies done annually in the U.S. and Europe, said Dr. John Lozier, who was on the tour from his multidisciplinary pain clinic in the University of Washington. Experiences like these seared doctors who were interested in pain management. Also on tour that year was Dr. Kathleen Foley from New York's Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Foley began her career in the 1970s, during the last years of the opiate dark ages, when doctors used these drugs under only the most controlled circumstances. By the 80s, Foley, a devout Catholic, had become a voice for these dying cancer patients and an advocate for treating their pain with opiates. In 1981, she transformed pain treatment for cancer patients at Sloan Kettering, bringing together researchers to study pain and clinicians to provide pain treatment, the first pain group of its kind. As time went on, Foley, however, took her advocacy of opiate treatment a step further. Opiates should not be confined to just cancer or post-surgical patients, she believed. She, they should also be used, she argued, to treat patients with pain that did not grow from a disease, injury, or surgery, pain that was chronic but equally life-mangling, bad lower backs, knee pain, and others. As I followed my story, I came to realize that this idea alighting on the realities of American medicine and medical marketing of the 1980s and 90s, eventually connected to why, years later, men from a small town in Mexico could sell so much heroin in parts of the country that had never seen it before. In 1984, a young doctor named, came to Sloan Kettering for a fellowship under Foley. Russell Portnoy had grown up in Yonkers and developed an interest in biology as a child. A dapper and articulate man, Portnoy attended Cornell, then medical school at the University of Maryland. He did a neurology residency at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Portnoy worked among Sloan Kettering cancer patients for almost two years. During the, during the 1980s and 90s, he and Foley helped midwife a new specialty in the American medicines, palliative care, treating the pain and stress of the seriously ill. 
It grew from a variety of influences. The hospice of movement of Cicely Saunders and the idea, then surprisingly uncommon in medicine, that death should be dignified. Palliative care involved far more than just drugs. It included psychological, spiritual, and family counseling. The new discipline gave Russell Portnoy the talking points I needed to mold my work life, he once wrote. As an emerging discipline, palliative care appealed to a bright young doctor interested in staking out his own ideas. Comforting, comforting the seriously ill and dying touched on all the altruistic reasons why anyone would enter medicine in the first place. What's more, it challenged him. Just knowing a symptom didn't mean he understood the patient. Portnoy wrote later that he found himself forced to study the profound uh, psychosocial and spiritual impact of advanced illness. He was forced to learn, for example, how to tell a family of a loved one's life-threatening illness. Palliative care, he came to believe, was guided by moral issues of patient autonomy and respect for cultural and individual differences. Decisions were made with the input of the patient and the family. This was very different from how medicine had treated serious illness and pain before. Watching people struggle with pain and talking to families who face the loss of a loved one gave Portnoy a touch of idealism, a bit of a crusader pushing up against conventional wisdom. In fact, the 1980s were good years for a young doctor with pain as his focus doing battle with conventional wisdom. Researchers had come to new understandings of how pain happened in the brain. The work of Cicely Saunders in England was dissolving the old bugaboos about the prohibition on using opiates in the U.S. Medical advances were extending the lives of cancer patients in some cases for months to years. These treatments were themselves painful and thus many more patients required attention for their pain. In 1984, Purdue Frederick produced one solution. It released MS Contin, a time-released morphine pill. The product of that conversation Robert Twycross had with the Knapp Pharmaceutical reps in England years before. MS Contin was intended for cancer and post-operative patients. In Salt Lake City, a doctor named Lynn Webster had been studying new techniques for acute pain at Holy Cross Hospital. One day in 1989, a woman named Dorothy had surgery on her lung. During surgery, Webster inserted in Dorothy's back an epidural catheter with an injection of pain medicine. Through the catheter, Webster gave her small, continuous doses of opioid anesthetics. Epidurals had been used in labor and delivery, delivery, but new research showed epidurals could be used for other things. They could, Webster reasoned, allow him to gain more localized pain control with less medication than the typical intravenous or muscular injections. In fact, Dorothy left surgery awake and coherent, unlike typical post-op patients who were prostrate and completely sedated. Word spread through the hospital. She asked for a coffee, stood up, and raised her arms, to the shock of the hospital staff. Nobody's done this before at the hospital. All these doctors and nurses are standing in the doorways, remembered Marcia Stanton, a nurse who worked with Webster at the time. She drinks her coffee and she's fine. She's not nauseated, which usually they are. Webster, and then others, energized by new possibilities, began treating more patients with this kind of pain control. To Russell Portnoy, these were revolutionary times. It was cruel not to give pain-relieving opiate drugs to dying cancer patients or those emerging from surgery. Soon this was no longer a controversial opinion in America. Terminal patients no longer had to die in agony. The pendulum was swinging toward more humane pain treatment. It thrilled him, Portnoy said later, to be able to relieve the crippling pain he saw in his patients. He viewed pain management as a white hat profession made possible by pharmaceutical companies' innovations. Their powerful new pain relievers seemed far less addictive because through their time release formulas, they eased relief out to the patient over many hours. Now, to the patient crushed by pain, quote, the pain management specialist who knows that he, what he or she is doing can go there and find a way to offer something that it doesn't provide comfort, it provides hope, he said later. I believe in drugs. I think pharmaceuticals are a great gift to humankind. So we'll uh, start with Pain and the Pro Wrestler with the next episode. That's on page 86. Keep fighting that good fight out there, guys. I'll talk to you later.